So this, uh, I have, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes to give an overview, a general overview of if you just trying to highlight um, some of the more recent uh, elements that we've released. I, I don't know how well, I know some of you are probably pretty familiar with it and others may not be, so it's sort of in the middle in terms of the amount of depth to go into it. And I did pull a few uh, additional pieces of information I thought this group in particular might be interested in, but uh, I'm happy to be fairly informal and have you guys uh, raise your hands or type questions um, along the way, and, and Josh and Kim can help me out um, with some of those as well. So for the uh, introduction of the IFTDIS team, I've got the names listed here. They may be small, but we're a fairly small team. Henry Bastian is the business lead, or the, excuse me, the project manager. Uh, we do have two business leads, one with DOI, which is Jason Fallon and Tim Sexton with the Forest Service. And then myself, uh, Kim Erstrom with the Park Service and Nicole Bayant with the Forest Service. Um, Bree Schuler is with us. Typically, she's on a detail now. And then we have an IBM team, and of course, Josh, who um, does most of our uh, support work and help content, and he's great. So we launched this version of IFTDIS in the spring of 2017, just to give a sense of um, who is using the application currently. It's about 70% uh, government employees and about 30% non-government. Um, so within that government, the Forest Service is the primary user, uh, but we do have uh, federal, local, and state as well. And then within the non-government, about 10% of that is academic. Um, there's some retirees um, and, and, and some private industry folks as well. The scale that IFTDIS was designed for is at the project to unit level, so in the hundreds to thousands of acres. Um, so you can look at it as scaling up or scaling down, but we do not do regional and national level risk assessments, and that becomes relevant in the conversation about how we approach uh, risk assessment and uh, comparisons of outputs and things within the application. Um, we can currently handle up to a three and a half million acre landscape in size for an analysis, which um, is the size of units for some agencies and too small for other units. Since its release, we've been compiling data on what current users are doing with the application. And of course, we've been adding functionality over time. But um, the primary uses we've seen so far are in NEPA specialist reports, especially with regards to fuels treatment planning, um, prescribed fire plans, CWPPs, um, and multi-year planning documents, uh, fuels treatment prioritization, we do have some uh, treatment alternatives comparison currently in the application. And also sort of an unexpected use is a poor man's um, GIS because we have a lot of preloaded data in there. So a map interface um, in public meetings because the data uh, crosses boundaries. We, we have national CONUS data sets for most things rather than agency specific. Um, although users can upload agency-specific data. Um, it's also being used in some fuels and fire behavior training and education. We'd like to see more of that because uh, it's a good tool to help people understand um, fire model inputs and outputs. And we're beginning to see use on active wildfires as well. I know I used it um, a few times this summer to, to look at some things that you can't traditionally look, look at with models uh, that are contained, say, within WOOFDIS in terms of um, communities and exposure and things like that. So the application itself, and I can open it up in a little bit and show you guys, but um, for those that aren't familiar, um, there's a uh, this cycle that's sort of a hub, which is on the landing page, um, to all the different functionality within it. And then um, under the one called landscape evaluation, it uh, covers more the creation of a landscape an evaluation of a landscape, and by landscape, that references a, the technical land fire landscape, you know, raster summary. Um, the workspace is, is your file management where you organize and keep all your work. The playground is where the models are run, and then the map studio is where you view um, the geospatial model outputs or any reference data. 
So what the application currently does, uh, we do have these consistent nationwide reference data sets for planning. Um, you can generate and edit landscapes, so uh, you can easily acquire land fire landscapes. We do have most of the 2016 land fire data loaded, not quite all of it, um, but uh, over half the US, the first, first half to two thirds that was released. Um, and then the editing, um, that can either be editing to represent a fuels treatment or to correct the data if there are any known issues with the land fire data. You can model fire behavior. We did release a quantitative wildfire risk assessment in June. Um, lots of different types of reports that can be generated. And similarly, most everything you do within the application can be downloaded to use in an external um, GIS program. Uh, this also is the home for FTEM, the Fuels Treatment Effectiveness Monitoring Program, which is required for uh, most federal land management agencies, at least USDA and DOI at this point. So we also host and maintain that. This is a quick snapshot of the uh, national reference data. There's, there's a tab, a little widget it's called, where you hit Add Layers and you just get a list. It's very similar to the list if people use WOFDIS. Um, you can just sort of shop through here and turn these layers on and off. They're contained under what's called if you didn't re this reference layers. There's another tab called My Layers where you store any uploaded data that, that you bring to the application if you want some local customization. So you can get the metadata and the details about the data. You can open an attribute table. You can create subsets of that data, lots of different GIS functionality within those data sets. And this is especially useful for cross um, boundary work where, where um, you know, agencies may have disparate data sets. This is just to demonstrate the file upload functionality and as well as the ability for users to create files within the application for geospatial purposes. The landscapes I mentioned, you just simply draw a square or put in a shape file and ask it to draw a square around it for you. Um, choose between 2012, 14, or 16 land fire data. Um, and, and we limit it to three and a half million acres and you can quickly generate a summary of that landscape um, or go in and edit it. But the summary is useful in determining the distribution of the attributes, how it looks on your map if you need to edit it. If there is a need to edit, you can do these uh, edits that represent different fuels treatment scenarios for planning purposes. So we've taken some of the um, tables that land fire has built over time as they've pulled in either plot data or user feedback to represent disturbances on the landscape um, and develop what we call the land fire lookup tool where you can represent four different types of treatment. These are a subset of of a full suite that Landfire has looked at over time. Um, and then with each, within each one of these, there's some classes of intensity or severity. So thinning, remaining slash, thinning, um, removing slash, clear cut or wildland fire. And then you can um, specify the time since disturbance. And rather than a, un a universal edit where a user draws a polygon and, and says, turn all my trees to shrubs, um, this actually looks at the underlying uh, data, such as the existing vegetation type, does a lot of cross-referencing, looking up and comes up uh, with an estimate of a fuel model distribution to represent that disturbance. So that can be done for fuels treatment planning, or there's also just a traditional landscape editor where you select your own attribute um, and apply it wherever you need to on the landscape to update your landscape. Like I said, you can generate uh, you can view it all on the map and, and use the identify tool to, to drill down to the data to evaluate the data. And you can also generate reports um, that provide charts, bar charts, pie charts, maps of the attributes of your landscape. In this example, so it's just a distribution of the canopy cover and a little thumbnail of the canopy cover, but a quick way to sort of evaluate your landscape. So beyond uh, the landscape editing, the next step is modeling fire behavior. Um, so there's, there's a, a sort of quick and dirty, you can do a landscape summary, which generates what we call an auto 97th report that estimates the 97th percentile conditions and does a quick um, land fire 
uh, landscape fire behavior or basic run, which is fire behavioral behavior at the pixel level. Each pixel is independent. Um, we've added, we have three models in total. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is a landscape burn probability model um, using the minimum travel time random ignitions, which is the burn probability model from Flam Map. Um, and then we're about to release um, early December this uh, spread model, the first spread model, MTT fire spread, or also known as short term. So this is a suite of the models contained within the Flam Map uh, application that will be available within IFTDIS or already are. So you just go to the modeling playground, pick your model that you want to run and populate your inputs. And you can run this from various places in the application. There's cards that take you um, and they gear you to the right model, depending on what it is that you're trying to look at, uh, whether it's doing a risk assessment or evaluating your landscape. Just a quick view of what you get, for example, for the outputs for the various ones. This is landscape fire behavior. Uh, like I said, it's independent pixel fire behavior. Um, this is Grand Teton National Park, for example, and this first left thumbnail is flame length distribution, red being the highest, uh, green being the lowest. The second thumbnail would be rate of spread, the third being crown fire activity. And you get one of these each time you do a run so you can test different weather scenarios um, and compare the outputs. So very useful for reporting, um, that kind of thing. The fire spread model uh, that's going to be released soon is just um, as it implies, we've customized the outputs more for a burn planning kind of scenario. So it's broken into burn periods. Um, so you put an ignition on the landscape, whether it's a, a point to simulate a stop fire or a lightning ignition, and then, and then you specify a duration, number of burn periods, and put your weather, and you get these um, spread rates and distances for the duration of your analysis. This output is time of arrival. Um, you can also get fire line intensity and rate of spread um, at the pixel level, and this bottom one represents major pathways, which can be useful in determining um, how a fire wants to get from point A to point B and what some of the pinch points might be in terms of strategy. And then lastly, the landscape burn probability model. Um, so just to differentiate this from uh, a lot of the published risk assessments, those are done using FSIM and the difference between what we're using and FSIM is that FSIM is uh, an annualized model that takes into account weather conditions throughout the, the duration of either the fire season or the entire year depending on how long your fire season is whereas with this model this is a single snapshot set of weather inputs so the user is specifying the conditions at the time of the model run and it's intended to be used in more worst case scenarios to look at uh, likelihood of problem fires and their distribution or probability across an ownership. So they're, they're fairly different uh, models in their purpose. Some of the outputs from this model are, the uh, this first thumbnail is burn probability and, and this is a relative distribution. So these are categorized probabilities with red being the highest and uh, blue with the cool colors being the lowest. And this probability, this output is independent for every run you do because it's, it's based on the maximum within that analysis area, hence the relative distribution. So you can't necessarily compare your probability distribution in Florida to that in California, um, but relative to within your analysis area, you can see the probability distribution. Um, the second thumbnail is the conditional flame length associated with that probability. So um, what is the probability of the different flame length distributions across the landscape uh, under these conditions? And then the third one is a sort of a homemade um, lookup table that we developed where you take the burn probability and the conditional flame length and cross-reference them to get something that we call integrated hazard. Um, it's uh, or just yeah integrated hazard so the the red being the highest hazard and the blue being the lowest because there's places that have high probability low flame length vice versa there's um, high flame length low probability so this sort of normalizes that distribution across your landscape 
So that's the burn probability model. Um, any questions or comments so far before I get into how we apply the burn probability in a risk assessment, which is sort of the next thing I was going to talk about? So Car Carolyn, maybe you could remind me, like, so um, adding uh, models, and, and, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, this would be one of those places perhaps where, you know, uh, a <clears throat> smoke forecasting or, you know, model to, to see what the various, if you're building different scenarios for your prescri or prescribed fire, you know, fills treatment or prescribed fire, this might be the place where one could, one would be inserted. Yeah, let's talk about that at the end because I think there's there's a bunch of different ways um, you could look at smoke and smoke modeling with what we have in here so far. Um, yeah, and I, I sort of, but yeah, that's a, a good comment. Any so, other comments yeah, or questions? The, the, this is Mark Fitch. A, a little bit M moving back to um, the previous slide where you had your um, probability models and you said you could put in your worst case scenario. How many yeah. points do you can you put in for weather observations? Is it just one point single. or a single it's, point? It's a single weather observation. It's not and even geographically located. Each it's each pixel gets that same. Um, there is spread going on in this model, but but each pixel gets the same weather conditions. We do. I should back up. Fuel moistures are conditioned based on the initial values you enter. Um, okay. But there is a, a wind direction and a wind speed, and you can usually read it from an output. <clears throat> like, presumably, this one has got a wind out of the southwest because you can sort of see a pattern where the higher probabilities tend to be as you move across this landscape. Um, but you do not specify where on the landscape that is, nor can you put more than one. So, for example, one thing we encourage to calibrate this model and make sure you're capturing the highest probability locations is to run it multiple times across the cardinal wind directions and see how much, how sensitive it is to that, um, whether it's really driven by the winds or if, if it's the fuels or the flame lengths that are driving this probability. Um, but it does take a little more um, iteration with this model to make, instead of one and done out of the box to make sure that you're picking up the trends that, that seem to be true on that landscape. So in, unless in you the, know pretty definitively what that scenario is. Copy. So in your previous slide before this, the model that shows the pinch, pinch points, so I like this, um, the winds would not be affected by the different drainage patterns associated with that, so the winds wouldn't change. They would only be from one direction at one speed as it, it wouldn't turn a corner or, or push push something down in another another direction or another drainage pattern, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. For the winds, it, we are using Wind Ninja, so oh, it will, you are. Um, okay. yeah, it okay, will that, pick up on that. Okay, that, that helps me a lot in under, understanding um, quite a bit of what you're doing, I was going to go to, to Wind Ninja, because Wind Ninja also allows us to input um, like her model information as well. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit later, how we might be able to incorporate that. But thank you for for that conversation. And you can proceed with your presentation. I'll ask questions. Sure. Later. Yeah, but to clarify that the, this is a spread model, so the Wind Ninja is is being used throughout the duration of you're putting in ignition on the landscape where these models are raster based or grid based so each cell is calculated independently so while we're using wind ninja to look at the winds terrain influence on those winds there's no not really a lot of spread patterns being picked up by it. there's some um, but it's not as direct as a wind ninja run if that makes sense okay I uh, yeah, that that helps a lot in, in the clarification of how the winds are used in the different models. Um, thank you, Carol. Sure, no problem. Um, so to get a little bit 
further into risk, because this is the newest release, um, we released this implementation of risk in four phases, and we tried to um, both break it into four phases for timing purposes, but also each one of these pieces of it can serve as an independent product. Um, so they all have products associated with them. So the first is uh, just simulating a wildfire or running a burn probability analysis. Um, the second is identifying the highly valued resources and assets on the landscape. We call it map values. Um, and I can show a little bit um, how that's done. Um, but, but those two things simply overlaid with, with the overlaid with each other have value, looking at your burn probability and your your values on the landscape. Uh, the third one uh, is an exposure analysis, which does a more uh, robust quantitative analysis rather than just overlaying them in a map. It, it runs calculations to look at the burn probability and flame lengths in the vicinity of these values you've identified. And these all come with uh, reports. And then the last one is the quantitative risk assessment where you're, you're um, adding in the uh, relative importance and response functions of these values to look at the um, net benefit and threat um, to fire, of fire to these values. So what that looks like within the application is um, this concept of net value change that is sort of synonymous with quantitative risk. Um, and it's taking into account uh, the burn probability or the likelihood, the um, intensity, which is the proportion of flame lengths um, for each, actually each pixel, and then the susceptibility and importance or, or the user-defined response functions importance. So all three of these things work together in defining risk. And you can see if you go around the map and click, for any individual cell, you're going to get a, a probability value. Uh, conditional flame length value, like in this case, it's four feet. But you're also going to get these proportion of flame lengths. So 4.1 feet was um, the weighted average, but um, there's a distribution sometimes. This one has 50% four to six feet, 45% two to four feet. But it, it takes every time that pixel burned in the simulated fires, which is thousands of fires, um, and tells you what that just distribution of flame lengths were. That's where the probability comes in. Then you've got these uh, initial inputs you defined of mid-flame wind speed, 20-foot wind speed, wind direction, and the fuel moistures, which again, you put an initial value and then they're, they're conditioned based on your landscape. So that's the, the burn probability component. Um, the map values component is um, done by the user in the interface. Um, where you're identifying these highly valued resources and assets. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this concept. This is sort of for the textbook Risk 101, which comes from GTR 35, one of the original quantitative risk assessment publications. And we were directed to follow that methodology model. So we did. So primary HVRA categories are sort of um, buckets or categories. I can actually pull over um, the interface for a minute just to show you guys what this looks like, I think, if this shows up. I can, you guys see in the, the IFTDIS interface here on the screen? Yeah, got it. Okay, so just to show you guys, if, if you're in the cycle, you choose strategic planning and you wanna go to do a risk assessment, you have these prerequisite steps that you need to do beforehand, but when you get to, actually, let me go to map values and show you better. Um, when you get to map values, um, you select the geographic extent you're interested in. Um, I'll just pick uh, randomly Acadia National Park. So that, that's going to draw a box around this extent of a landscape I've already built. And then you choose these categories for what's important. Let's say air quality. Um, now, don't get too excited because we don't want to get on the weeds in air quality yet. But then uh, that's going to pop up immediately. It's looking for intersections between your landscape and available data that we have nationwide coverage for. You can see the little U.S. symbol. So what we have here is the national uh, coverage for emission potential for 
uh, PM 2.5. And there's actually a low, a moderate, and a high category. There, there apparently is no low. It's only going to list the things that did intersect with your landscape. As I click those on, they immediately show up on the map. And then they're also being populated over here in the layer list. So I can see, oh, OK, the red is high PM 2.5 emission potential. And the yellow is low PM 2.5 emission potential. So you go through these categories. And these layers are all uh, from the national risk assessment done by Dylan, Greg Dylan. Um, and we have all these available within in the application. Another one might be communities. It's behind the scenes looking for what the intersections are. And then I can turn on low, moderate, and high density communities. Um, and if I, for example, turn off the air quality, now I can see, OK, that darker red is the high density community of Bar Harbor. Um, the shaded is, is the uh, lower density. And the pink is the moderate density. So you go through this process of checklist of saying, these are my highest values on this landscape. And you can either use this uh, national reference data, or you can upload your own data if there's specific values, whether they be uh, vegetation, wildlife, or whatever. Uh, build these this, these buckets of values for your landscape. There's there's uh, you know infrastructure, surface drinking water, et cetera. You can create custom ones, and you just build this list of values and save it, um, and call it you know my highly valued resources and assets set for that given landscape. So I just wanted to kind of show that to you guys. And I'll walk through what you do. So you, you go through this process of whoopsies, um, picking your values. Um, and so the HVRA sets are the categories. The primary HVRA and the sub HVRAs are the actual footprint of those values. Um, and you build this map set. And the next step. Um, Here's what it might look like when you've populated a bunch of different things. It's going to show you everything on your map. You can turn it on and off and interrogate it. Um, you can overlay, say, a model output and swipe and kind of see where your flame lengths are highest or whatever. But at that point, you probably just want to go ahead to the next step, which is the exposure analysis, which is going to take that value set that you've defined and then um, summarize burn probability, flame length, and hazard specifically for those values. When you do that, um, you'll get a report. And I can pull up one more closely, but it will show you for each category that you define for values, whether it's communities, ecosystem function, infrastructure, um, what the mean prob burn probability, mean integrated flame length, um, and integrated hazard are for that category of values. So. That's what an exposure um, analysis calculates. You can see here the swipe tool where you might look at um, your communities in relation to your burn probability, kind of looking back and forth. So uh, any questions or comments on exposure? The next step will be what a risk ex assessment does beyond exposure. But if we want to look more closely at exposure, we can do that now. OK. So the next step, just uh, I said this is a four-step process. So you've run your burn probability, uh, mapped values. You've done this exposure analysis. And if you want to take it to the final step, you do a, a full-on quantitative risk assessment. And the addition to a risk assessment is relative importance and user-defined response functions, which represent this susceptibility and importance factor. So you know how that vegetation or community is going to be impacted. But it's sort of, is that good, bad, how much do I care kind of aspect to it. Let me pull back the interface just to show you what that looks like. Um, so this is something that we, we feel pretty excited about the, uh, let me just copy one of these, um, the interface that, that we've created for this. So when you you have one, the, the the, the relative or the response function, excuse me, is where you define with a group of experts uh, what the impacts are in terms of uh, benefit or threat to a given value. In this case, this is communities um, by flame length class. So here I've got zero to two, 
all the way up to greater than 12 foot flame lengths across the top. Um, and these are just cells that, that you populate. Um, so I can change these values. And so in the case of something like communities, we've defaulted to the national um, data set. So it comes pre-populated with this increasing negative response for communities as flame length increases, but you can you can edit these all you want if there's for some reason um, you would find a benefit to a given value. So it's kind of handy for some of these layers that they come pre-populated but editable. In this example, I just have communities and infrastructure. There certainly could be more. Um, and then the relative importance down here is where again this this group of managers or uh, stakeholders defines. Um, What's, what's the most important things on this landscape? Are we most concerned about communities and infrastructure? There may be other things, or do I think communities is really 90%? Um, and then it sort of adjusts this, this pie chart and shows you how you're putting different values against one another um, for your risk assessment. So it's a very dynamic interface to help a group of managers sort of hone in on agreement about threat or benefit to a given value based on fire and then how important these different values are. Um, and then the risk assessment is run. So back to the slides for a minute. So these are just screen captures that don't really do the dynamic nature of that interface justice, but you can see here, you know, with more values, you've got a better distribution of the relative importance pie chart and then when there's benefit, you have these dark reds and these miniature um, bar charts or histograms are showing as flame length, you know, increases or decreases. Are you saying threat or benefit increases or decreases? This can also be uploaded uh, from a spreadsheet as well. It can get uh, tedious to enter all these values, but this is a critical part of the, the model input phase. And the thing about IFTDIS that's, that's really unique is that, um, all the risk assessments that you've probably seen as publications, they would wait years for the FSIM results and then they have this static on the shelf product. So there's not really any go backs like, well, I'm not really sure that I meant to list that threatened and endangered vegetation as as high as I did, or I'm not sure what impact that had on my analysis. You can come in here and change this and these, these runs really don't take all that long. So you can um, hone your results to make sure that everybody's input is captured and you're getting um, the right representation. You're not stuck with an output once it comes out. And the ultimate product from the risk assessment is this concept of net value change. So um, net benefit or net threat across the landscape. This, this is, I think, um, the Ochico National Forest boundary. So what Risk can get pretty heavy in terminology, but what we're looking at here is there's two outputs. There's one that's called conditional weighted net value change. So that's um, assuming a condition of a fire. Um, you're taking away the burn probability or the likelihood from the equation. So you're just looking at that HVRA set, response functions and importance, and that flame length distribution, the intensity and the susceptibility. And we have these little triangles to help you remember what's going into it. And then this, this color histogram is, you know, the, the darker greens are the um, greatest benefit and the darker reds are the greatest threat. And when it's mapped across the landscape, this is net. So it's taking for an individual pixel, there may be a threatened species, there may be an air quality concern, there may be a surface water concern. It's taking all those importances um, and all those uh, response functions and doing a weighted average of the calculations based on the probability and saying, okay, for all the things you identified as important, this is either a net threat or a net benefit to this, this geographic chunk right here. So that's what the conditional one is. And the only difference from the conditional on the left to the expected on the right is the expected takes the burn probability into account. So it, it kind of depends on the planning questions you're asking, which one is most important? We thought it important to include both products. Um, so if you're wondering, you know, what's the likelihood of this ever happening on the Ochico? You know, you might be more in the expected realm, or if you're wondering more uh, when this happens, um, what do I do 
um, or I know I'm in a really bad fire year, um, here's the conditions. Um, what, what's, what's it look like in terms of the distribution across the landscape? There's a couple other outputs associated with this. This is just a, a bar chart that summarizes that, that map for that whole analysis area, the orange being the um, total threat and the blue being the total benefit. So the sum of all those pixels and all the importance and everything on the Ochico, um, there's generally you know, a threat that's two times higher than the benefit if I look at the whole the forest as a whole. And then that's broken down by the, in this chart, by the, the categories of values you define, whether it's, uh, you know, there's some that are the BLM grazing allotments, wilderness, roadless area. And for each one of the, those, those categories, it's looking at the footprint of that and the net benefit or threat. So you can start to tease out it's beneficial to this, you know, one value, um, but it's also pretty negative. You know, you can start to pick those things apart. Whoops. In each one of those, there's charts associated with these in these reports. So that's a, a pretty quick and dirty risk just to continue here, and then we can have questions if we want. But the um, you can download all these things, the, the uh, model outputs for further analysis for really teasing out some of the details if you choose. Any one of these things can be downloaded as a geotiff. Um, we do have a very awesome um, help content set of YouTube videos, recorded webinars that uh, Josh Hyde has put together and manages. So um, Josh can definitely help you guys find anything you need in terms of that. And there's a lot of good help right within the application, um, including like, what's this page? You know, you can just say on this page, what am I doing? Um, but what's next, this is our sort of uh, generic what's next. I do have some more detailed up-to-date information, but we're, we're on the verge of releasing this new spread model um, within probably two weeks. And with that will come the ability to download shapes and shape files. That's something that users have asked for for a long time. Um, and then we're beginning to work on comparison functionality. We recognize the desire to be able to compare these different outputs and different scenarios. So the first one we're building is comparing weather. So if I Put different in two different weather scenarios, um, actually up to five is what we're building. Um, show me how that impacts these outputs. The next thing will be compare treatment alternatives. Right now we can only compare up to two. You can develop a bunch within the application, but our comparison charts and tables are limited to two alternatives at a time, so you have to do a lot of iterations. And then we want to extend that to compare risk, exposure, and landscapes, primarily for that pre and post treatment so you can game out with say a risk assessment. If we were to do the FY21 proposed treatments, how is that going to change risk and exposure on the landscape? Uh, we also have always uh, enhancements to the fields treatment effectiveness monitoring portion of the application that are desired. Um, and then uh, if this is a pretty um, intensive system in terms of, uh, you know, how many, how big those files are and, and the computations at the raster level uh, to generate a lot of those analyses. Um, it's, it's a cloud-based application and we're doing some modernization and improvement, including getting a new cloud hosting contract. Um, right now we have uh, landscape, all these are service or cloud-based landscape, landscape editing um, and fire modeling. Uh, so like when we get a new model, um, we just replace the DLL in the cloud. We don't have to worry about versioning. That's the beauty of the, the web-based model. Um, but all this has maintenance associated with it. So we're moving a lot of those to uh, new hosting services platforms soon. And we're also working with the fire environment, MS, whatever that is, um, to begin to pull in various weather services. That's that's in development, just writing the requirements right now. So those are some things going on in the background. Um, so I'll pause, I guess there, I did put together more information on that air quality information, a little bit more on where we are with our contracts and schedule, but I'm not sure if people have other questions before I dive into that. If not, I can show you. Um, just to explain 
that air quality data, and this is pretty small, isn't it? Um, if you're not familiar with the, the air quality data in the National Risk Assessment, it's really emission potential, um, and it's based on land fire. Uh, so I could just make this big so people can read it. This is the metadata, which we link to, but it's, it's used in this national HVRA data set. Um, and it's the potential for fine particulates um, based on FOFM. Um, so the inputs, inputs are based on FOFM and then the land fire data and FIA. Um, and then it was divided into these three categories of low, moderate, and high emission potential. And again, it's at the, the pixel level, so there's no dispersion. And it tends to, um, I don't know what they're using exactly, but for example, when I use that, in Florida, you know, there's a lot of emission potential that, that comes off. So if you use um, air quality as a value um, and denote it as negative, for example, that, that will definitely impact that risk assessment into a, a net threat or dark red, unless there's some reason you'd want to account for uh, a benefit associated with it by reducing you know the fuels by by burning it during a less intense time where the the consumption may be different but it doesn't do those nuances you would have to do that through your um, importance and response function categorization so let's see that's so that's basically what that layer is and that's really currently the extent of the air quality information that's contained within the application right now that I can think of um, Kim, am I missing something where where there's uh, other things that cover or address that at this point? Either Kim, 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 or Kim, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's what we for now. That's you know, I think where we're at. Actually. Yeah, for now that's um, what we have. Yeah, I think that's sort of leading into the discussion of what you know, kind of what should be next. Yeah, and I put this together, and I don't know if Henry was able to join. He manages both the Fire Modeling Services Framework and IFTDIS. Um, so I asked uh, Reggie Goolsby, who's who's the technical lead on the Fire Modeling Services Framework this morning, like, hey, what's going on? Because I know that they have added the, the spatial FOFM model to the Services Framework. And that doesn't mean it, it, it's usable. That's still a prototype just to be able to run models in the cloud. Whoops. So it's it's not currently available to users. So this, these slides are, are more from my own notes. Um, they're about to move to a production environment. Um, you know, they're currently, they were in uh, prototyping development. There's no user interface or application hooked to it right now. These are just like raw, you know, send inputs, get outputs type of data. Um, and I know the services framework, once it moves to a production level environment will be accepting new models um, and I, I've seen a comprehensive list of all the possibilities but I don't know the process or the timing for when the model selections and implementation will be I'm sure it'll be um, they're hoping to be in a new environment by say March but then which models they choose um, I'm not quite sure Henry can answer that and then um, again it, that's just inputs and outputs how they use the a user interface or a connection to pre and post processing that data in and out of the modeling services framework is is a workload as well. Um, and then I, I sat in for part of I missed the beginning yesterday of Duncan Lutz and um, I forget the other gentleman's name yesterday um, where what was going on you know where they were with the smoke modeling work, and that's not dispersion, right? That was just consume, I believe they were talking about. Um, but he was recommending, you know, we do add it into IFTDIS. Um, so I'm just putting here, adding FOFM spatial, that would be the starting point because that's already in a format that's, um, you know, grid-based. It would be easier for us to connect with that because it's already gone through that process. Um, but that would have to be identified by the business leads as a priority for, for development. Um, so that's that's sort of the gist of uh, where I know things sort of stand and what what span of timeframes we would have to be looking at, but that's where you guys um, 
as the smoke experts probably could have some conversations with those business leads um, as to the prioritization process um, and where this could fit in, if that's helpful. And that, that's the FMC? Uh, uh, no, the business leads would be Tim Sexton and Jason Fallon. Um, that's right. I mean, they work with the FMC, so certainly any FMC representative, we do speak with the FMC fairly frequently um, about priorities. It's, it's sort of a two-way street there. Yeah. And we have not met with the FMC since before fire season. Everybody sort of went their own way in June, and yeah, no people are just starting to crawl back out. So that would be a discussion with Jason and Tim, right? Okay. I think so. And, you know, whether it's through, I don't know how you guys interact with the fuels committee. Um, I don't know who the chair is currently, but certainly Frankie for the forest service. Um, but they have to balance, you know, we've got three, three applications here and one really, we have the fuels treatment effectiveness monitoring this fire modeling services framework and if you this and unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you look at it I did want to point out here that we're all going through uh, contract transitions right now um, so our contract the if this development contract ends in February um, we're likely going to get a six-month extension but you know sometime during that three to nine month period we'll be going through a vendor transition potentially um, the cloud services is changing within the next month or two and the fire modeling services framework is on the same time frame as us so there's going to be lulls in development while these transitions happen um, and, and and i mentioned the sort of tightening of the environments in terms of um, the cloud you know we're it's modern and that everything's internet based and and we can do larger landscapes and very computation intensive, but it's, you know, there's maintenance associated with that and system upgrades and mm -hmm. um, version upgrades and all that that seems to all be sort of coming to a head about now for the transition time period. Huh. Well, very, very good, Carolyn. Um, yeah, it's really, like you said, it's grown up. <laughs> yeah, Lilithi's gotten pretty big. We're excited to have three models and um, have that compare functionality, I think, is going to open it up for uh, more of the um, field technician burn plan audience. And some of this other stuff is, is more higher technical skill user with the risk assessment and stuff, but just putting in your, your low, moderate, and high prescriptions for a fuels treatment planning scenario and, and seeing spotting potential and doing your contingency planning, I think that'll be, that'll be fairly popular, I hope, in the user community. Yeah, I think uh, that, 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 that seems pretty powerful to me right away, um, you know, being able to compare that because that's usually how you build your prescription, you know, and so that's that's it. That's pretty uh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I listed here. These are all things sort of on the plate for future development. There's the compare work plus collaboration. We still want to uh, work on um, teams working together. You know, right now you have all the same data, but you can't log in and look at the same stuff. Uh, we want to do that, and then the burn planning stuff. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it just. Um, I know that it's. Uh, it, it, well, it, it open it up to you know Mark or Gary or Mary, any of the other people that have any questions or comments, thoughts especially related to smoke and impacts and... uh, this is Gary I, I'm just trying to digest it all I'm just gonna I, I, I need time to think but, yeah, I... but it's it's powering but I just need time to think on it yeah. 
Yeah, this is the first time you've seen it, huh, Gary? Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it can be pretty daunting. It's a pretty, it's a pretty large. Um, it's hard to summarize for us any more in a half an hour. Sorry about that. Yeah. It, it does a lot. No, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, no doubt it does a lot. Again, this is Mark kind of speaking up. Um, I think there, Dave, there, there's a lot of potential for including smoke impacts for those who are doing NEPA uh, analysis. I mean, how we fit it in and which models do we use for those planning um, is going to be something that we're going to have to talk about. I don't know if we can come up with anything right at this point, but now that we seen the framework and the way it's laid out and some of the models that already integrated into the system the fire spread and the, and the like it's like how do we now um how do we use this in a planning situation it may not be the tool for operational but how do we use this for the planning and that gets to the project we kind of have uh, going on with sim you know we've talked about this before we need to kind of and maybe we had a direct it to seeing how we can add that that sort of smoke impacts analysis or um, planning for smoke tool and integrate it into the um, this project and move it forward versus kind of outside of this framework so I think it would fit very nicely here um, yeah we'll see. Yeah, theoretically, for sure. Now, how would, how does it work um, with all the other technical tools that, that are developed? Does it fit and migrate into here? Who knows? And that's beyond my scope. Yeah, you, you, Mark, this is Gary again. I, I agree. I mean, the way I was trying and my way my brain is trying to think on this is operational. Uh, because a lot of, you know, my background and my experience is we need tools in the field now and and it's like right now we're going to do it now uh you know just like uh, for example maybe this is not a good analogy but you know i run pc high split for smoke dispersion on the hood of a pickup truck and we do the run and i look at the burn boss and say let's go we got a green light and, and that's operational real-time decision made in the field yeah and i think that we have a pretty good uh suite of tools to do that gary um yeah. th there is a need and we uh, dave's heard it i've heard it a lot i know that the forest service I've, I've heard it from janice peterson who was on for a while um that there is a need for a smoke modeling for planning purposes mm -hmm. in other words you come up with your general prescription or what's the impact going to be as they talk to air quality um, uh, regulatory agencies and the like and so I mean outside of that sort of operational that you just described there there is a need and and sometimes we kind of fall short in some of our modeling um, capacity to be able to help those people in the field who do planning work um, and I see this as if you did the planning tool right well and, and I can see this as being the other side of the coin and of operations versus planning anyway that's my two cents on yeah and I, I look I come in at it from the risk assessment or you know my mind goes towards that you know any risk assessment you know should include uh, potential smoke impacts uh, over duration right and, and, and so is that, is there a way, you know, where, where would that fit in? How could we fit something some in uh, the risk assessment? Because, you know, a lot of risk assessments are fire risk assessments, but they don't include, you know, potential smoke impacts as part of the risk assessment. Right, I, I, that, that's a really good point. Um, Especially to values at risk, we identify values at risk, and there's communities, and there's, and it's values that it's at, at risk for being impacted by the fire itself. But part of the fire itself it includes smoke impacts, and and those are always absent, or it seems like they're always absent. Yeah, uh, this like does a have that. I was, I was trying to show you guys, but it's it's emission potential strictly yeah. based on fuel loadings. So I yeah. don't know how useful that is. In my experience, it 
it's always going to give you a huge red flag because it's assuming a large proportion of that fuel profile is consuming. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and since this is GIS based, I mean, there are um, in, in planning circumstances, that, particularly for smoke and impacts, um, layers of where non-attainment areas are or sensitive. Um, like Oregon mm -hmm. has a lot of things, the SAS or something like that, they call it sensitive areas where you don't want to put smoke. Um, as part of the risk assessment for not so much the escape of a fire or spread of the fire, but it's like where would the smoke go that you don't want to put the fire, even even under if it spreads in this direction from the southwest southwesterly direction like the fire spread model, would it be spreading into these areas of, of borders of non-attainment, whether it's for ozone or PM or whatever the case might be, um, could be a, a, also another critical element for planning purposes. Yeah, and I mean, from, and I'm coming from the evolution being into seeing if you just right from the very conception of the to where it sits, not where it's sitting now. And <sighs> There's been some incredible strides, and it seems to me that you know that they're able to incorporate um, just about any model <laughs> that that is out there out of the thousands of models that are what there's over 300 fire behavior models or something like that. Um, so, I mean, you know, we. I, I mean, I think it comes down to, and she had this, and, and Carolyn had the slide of, uh, you know, what would the priorities be? And we would have to engage with the, the business leads on, on, on what we would want as part yeah. of a kind of risk assessment. And I think I like the comparison part, and I really think that could be a part of it is, you know, when, when you're comparing different, you know, the high, moderate, low prescriptions, well, what does that mean for smoke then? In the in the low prescription range, what you know, what uh, what kind of smoke can we can be predicted uh, if it burns under that scenario, and and where might that smoke go? You know, like thinking of roadways, etc. Uh, yeah, I and I think that that's right, and that's where um, the work that we need to do to put together a plan or what we would like to see in, in an integrated sense within the yeah. model yeah before we would even go to whoever um dave yeah. uh, fallon or, or uh, bastion or whoever that we need to talk to um, um you know and so that's where you know and then which what are our priorities what would we like to see first and then second because we were just going to be just in the laundry list of things that needs to be done for the model and it may not be the priority for other people but we need to be very um surgical in, in what we want and just said oh we just want smoke dispersion well it looks from this as a very thought out process yeah, right. how do we integrate into that and i think that's going to be our our and heavy lift we have to realize it would be long term i mean it's not sure. you know, over the next year or two. Yep, I well, think you're right. Well, a couple of things for you guys. It's, it's a good conversation. When we award the new contract, we're, well, back up. We have, we've built a strong foundation now, right, where this concept of plug and play models is becoming more reality and less words. So the concept of we have this single queue of customers waiting that want to get integrated. Um, it's not a great model, right? There, there's going to be a lot of functionality people want to put in here, and it doesn't make sense to have everyone stand in a line and we spend three to six to nine months for each customer and add smoke and add burn plans. So it's to me, the, the new contract is Potentially, the, the vendor can hire a bunch of subcontractors and simultaneous work by simultaneous teams could be oh. happening. Oh. Now, it's conceptual because we still need to be able to support that on our end, and there's still like two of us because um, we have to work with those contractors. But that you know, the government in theory could add more people, or or the field. You guys could provide the smoke experts to to do what we're doing. It, you know, they would be better anyway than I would. Um, but the point is, I guess, when 
when those conversations do happen with the business leads, I think they need to keep hearing that because this, this model of one customer at a time will, will be slow. And I guess the other thing is that we're we're going to start taking more of an IDIQ approach where the customer you come with a task order that says your requirements I want a smoke dispersion model that has data in this format and you know needs to to do the outputs need to be x y and z and, and they can that's going to be much more successful than the conceptual like I think Mark was just saying like finding what you want and coming with a pretty specific, obviously that's going to need to be honed, but saying, here's what we want. Can you can you find a subcontractor to do this work? Um, well, that's uh, that's cool because those IDIQs work and they work well. Um, yeah, and then if you can bring a whoever it is that's a you know technically savvy smoke expert and say they'll work with you and be the we call it the product owner, the subject matter expert working with the development team, then, then you know, you're sort of a, your own package um, and you don't need to rely on Kim and Josh and I to be the, the go-between like Dave, you experience with FTEM, it's sort of a slow process yeah. versus having direct access to the developer yourself. Boy, that's, uh, that's really appealing. And so, you're think you're saying that 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 kind of a, of a voice needs to go back to Tim and and uh, Jason. That hey, you know, putting it into an IDIQ format would really help. And 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 that way, you know, you you know that whether it's a committee, whether it's an agency, whether it's a you know what whatever group, uh, can, you know, like smoke could come up with its, it, it, it theoretically, I guess, could come up with its own funding mechanism to provide money to that idea. I suppose there's a, lot of, there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, you know, regulatory hoops to jump through like normal because, I mean, would they have to go through the board, et cetera, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, but like as we grow, and these would be good questions for Henry too. I'm sorry, he was double booked, but just how do we govern this? Um, yeah, governance, you know, that kind of thing. Well, you've got this infrastructure in place. I mean, you've got the the governing infrastructure in place. Really? Yeah, exactly. We got a pretty strong foundation at this point. It took a while to get here, but yeah, I know. now it's cruising down the road. So. Um, it's a good time to start using it. Wow, well, cool. Hey, this is Kim. I was going to add, too, that, you know, as, as you guys hear how this is going to work in the future, especially as we move into this new contract next year, um, you know, now now is the time. It takes, as you guys know, as Caroline's saying, you know, it takes a while to put all this stuff together. And I think what we're finding, and we're finding this with some of the burn plan implementation stuff that everyone's like, oh, what about a burn plan and all this? And it's like, well, that's, sure, that sounds great, but what do you want? Like, what do you want it to look like? What does the field need? You know, just to throw out these general, you know, statements is, is good for the discussion starter, but when it really comes down to it, identifying those requirements and what, you know, what the field really needs to do their work, um, is where the rubber hits the road and is often where we don't have the information you know and we really rely well, on you guys to to yard that up and then come to us to say okay this is what we've boiled it down to and now we need to figure out how to implement that into these these applications and so to me it's that piece that's really missing and yeah. so i guess as we go through this process and talk about smoke and tools and such, um, I think we have to put some of that back on, you know, just like the fuels committee with some of the burn plan stuff, put this smoke tool type of discussion on you guys to say, go to the field and find out what is needed, you know, at the field level. And then maybe there is something more at like a, re, you know, a regional level or, um, whatever it might be, and, and, and then figure out if, if that fits into the IFTD sort of, um, you know, intent, I guess. So. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at a little bit earlier, Kim. Yeah. Exactly right. I may not have 
um, no, that's, uh, kind of spoke, but I, yeah. but I think that that's, that's what we need to do. And that's the heavy lift that smoke has to do um, uh, along those lines. I, I, I concur 100%. Understand. Yeah, and you know, I help teach the burn box class every year here at the Great Basin, and you know, those folks come through, and we, you know, there's the smoke section of the burn plan and all that, and you know, we get Josh does a great job of demonstrating some of the tools that are available and um, and shows them, you know, we show them fd disc and everything, and you know, and it gets the, the wheels spinning in their brains about about that little piece of their world, you know, and. So I think it's taking that idea and then, you know, and breaking it into the audiences, you know, who, who are the people that need these things? And then what, what does that look like when you're sticking it into a, like an nifty this type system? So knowing, you know, the audience piece of this is really important and um, we struggle with that, I think. So anyway, I just, I leave that with you guys, I guess is, as we move forward and if there's, if there's things that come to mind and there's some an analysis or whatever it could be done, some surveying of the field, collecting, you know, input like that somehow to sort of trim it down to what, and then, you know, and sort of prototype it as we go into this next contract. It's like, huh, let's, you know, let's try that. Let's, let's try this with this tool and see if this meets the need we've come up with. It, right. You know, it might take a few tries to kind of get it, get it right. But, um, oh, right. I think that's where we have to start. So good. Any, anything else from anyone? I know Pete, Pete's been, had to step off for a while now. Well, yeah. So, I mean, there's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we kind of I, I kind of have a good idea of you know where where we need to go, what we need to you know the, at least we started a discussion and you know it's incumbent to the smoke committee to continue it if that's what you know the the priority and where we where we need to go. So, but th this um, this was really informative for me too. I like I said I you know I've stepped away from it just for a little while, um, but it's. Um, you know, it's gotten big. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have to admit that I remember some of those early if you guess days, um, conversations with Nate Benson, who was involved in that, those early JFSP if you guess stuff, and it has come a long way. And this is great. And it it has given us a lot to think about and how we might be able to integrate some of the work that we we do in the smoke smoke yeah. planning for smoke planning and not. Um, you know the fuel stuff but very cool thanks for the presentation we appreciate it yeah yeah we used to be able to present it in you know 30 minutes and now it's yeah we just barely <laughs> can scratch the surface <laughs> you gotta have, yeah you gotta have a symposium for crying out loud <laughs> but that shows you you know how far along it's come and um, how busy everybody's been so cool um any other questions or comments and if not we'll say goodbye <laughs>